Cool. Uh, would like to start. Uh, don't have much time. This is just a 30-minute talk. So uh, hopefully they can record it on time as well. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sachin. I work for a company called Platform9. And I'm hoping to tell you uh, our story about a sort of DIY implementation of MySQL as a service. Um, so what is this about? And uh, before, before we dive into too much of details, uh, does, do all of you know uh, or have experience with Kubernetes operators? Uh, somewhat? OK. Uh, I'll just start from the basics then. So I, I work as an engineering lead at Platform9. And uh, I've been looking into this cloud native space for a while now, uh, particularly interested in how do you run cloud native applications on Kubernetes platform, and how do you run them in production? So those are the kind of problems I'm uh, currently interested in solving. And this is just one of the, the sort of side projects that we did in this effort. Uh, just a mandatory slide about my company. Uh, so Platform9 is a, is a hybrid cloud company. We offer uh, cloud management for customers who are interested in running uh, workloads on-prem as well as in public clouds. Uh, it's a single management control plane, which, is, uh, which provides SLA guarantees uh, for your cloud environment. And we have around 300 cloud regions that we manage for our customers. And we have around half a million uh, virtual CPUs that are currently managed by Platform9. And uh, we offer cloud services, which are both virtual machine-based as well as uh, container-based. Uh, for containers, we, we use Kubernetes as the, the platform. So here's the agenda and a few things I would like to go over. So I would like to first describe what problems we faced in order to actually do this DIY uh, MySQL solution and what kind of feature set we were looking for in a MySQL offering uh, that we wanted to create in-house, and why we chose Kubernetes in particular. Because Kubernetes is, is not really meant for, uh, or at least the perception is that it's not really meant for running uh, stateful applications like MySQL. And uh, then I would like to uh, introduce you to the architecture, and we, can, uh, we, we dive a little bit deeper into it to tell, so that you can understand what are the different things involved, uh, how do we handle, uh, high availability, et cetera. Um, we have been running this for a while. Uh, we have been running this for about a year and a half now for our own consumption. So we learned quite a bit on that journey. So I would like to share some stories uh, and various pitfalls that uh, you, you can watch out for if you're thinking of doing something similar, and uh, some of the future things uh, that we look forward to, uh, to add to this, uh, this particular project. So let's just uh, dive right into it. So um, we are about a five and a half year old company. And uh, like any startup, when we started, uh, we just used a public cloud service for everything, pretty much everything, uh, including our uh, business software, in a, uh, use our databases uh, for long-term storage, like object store and so on. But as we grew and our customers base grew, the demands on uh, the public cloud increased, and correspondingly, our spend on public cloud increased many fold. And that becomes a bottleneck in any kind of company, and this is especially true for startups, because it becomes like your, one of your top spends that you want to avoid. So we made the strategic decision about a three year, three year ago to, to move completely uh, on-prem and uh, use everything that we offer to our customers to run our own uh, software stack. And um, this experiment, this, this effort was quite successful when it came to compute and storage and networking components that we were using. But for higher level services like the, the database, uh, there was quite some period where we couldn't really figure out a good solution which could just replace a managed uh, SQL service uh, with, uh, and just run it on-prem without having much expertise in MySQL or without having uh, a lot of knowing, without uh, knowing much internals of uh, SQL itself. And that's how this, this project came into being. So we started to look at what are the possible on-prem solutions we could use for running MySQL, and uh, we stumbled on Kubernetes. 
But before that, what, we, what did we look out for? So when we used managed MySQL, um, we, we were pure, using uh, purely MySQL for, so all our software stack assumes MySQL primitives. So we didn't want the solution to break our existing software, not introduce new bugs into it. So we wanted a drop-in replacement for MySQL. We wanted uh, this solution to have self-service and automation capabilities because, because we were using already a managed SQL solution, everything, our, all our deployment was automated. And it assumed API, and it assumed uh, an API-centric way for configuring, scaling databases, uh, making changes to them, taking them down, and so on. Availability was important. Uh, because we ultimately we wanted to run our production deployments on it. So we were looking for a solution where a single node failure doesn't impact the availability of our databases. And we also wanted something which provide, provided an inbuilt disaster recovery, uh, so backups built in. Uh, some of the things we were also desiring were the portability aspect, because from our experience, we learned that once you start using public clouds, it is easier to move your compute workloads. But if you use higher level services, it's very difficult to get out once you have a production environment already running and an automation which is already set up and a bunch of customers depending on it. So the solution we wanted to design, we wanted to be portable uh, and so that we could just switch platforms without impacting our entire software stack. We, uh, we were looking for an open source alternative, and uh, just whatever we learned from this experiment, we wanted to contribute back to the community. We, we are looking for a cloud native solution because our software stack, like many other companies, is evolving from a VM based world to a cloud native microservices world. So, more and more of our services run on Kubernetes, and we wanted something which integrates really well with those services. And uh, last but not least, we wanted full-fledged monitoring and alerting with this, because once you run it in production, you better have that. So with that, we looked at a bunch of alternatives. So first thing we looked out for was actually VMs, and uh, we tried to write, write automation and just bring up a SQL cluster using the virtual, ma uh, virtual machine-based model. But that didn't pan out well, mainly because it's very easy to provision MySQL using some sort of automation, like Ansible. But once that thing runs in production, if it fails, it is very difficult to handle failures in an automated manner. And that's why we liked Kubernetes so much, because Kubernetes uh, has uh, this main advantage that once you run anything on Kubernetes, it makes sure that that thing keeps running. And when it, it heartbeats and checks that failures don't happen, if they happen, it tries to correct it. We also like Kubernetes because of the, the agility offered by the container model. Like arguably, running MySQL in a container is, uh, is, is, a, very, uh, is a very new or challenging idea, uh, but it, it worked uh, in the end. Uh, and running these databases using Kubernetes uh, reduces our deployment time dra dramatically because containers can come up in a few seconds versus a virtual machine-based workload, which can take tens or more minutes. Uh, Kubernetes also offered us uh, the declarative API. So every database object is essentially a JSON manifest, and all the configuration, uh, all the resources allocated, everything is, uh, is available as one JSON document that we can check in into our GitHub repo and track changes. So that's very, uh, that's very attractive. Um, I already talked about reconciliation a little bit. Uh, and running MySQL on uh, Kubernetes used to be a novelty, but it's not that anymore, especially this year, since Kubernetes has adopted stateful sets as the first class citizen. And most of the database companies like Oracle, MariaDB, Percona, they support running their database on a Kubernetes platform. They have uh, uh, container images, which are official container images that you can use to run on Kubernetes. And we also like the portability aspect of Kubernetes, uh, because Kubernetes can run on public many public clouds today, 
as well as private cloud environments. And essentially, when you run software on Kubernetes, you're dealing with higher level constructs that Kubernetes offers instead of worrying about underlying machine and underlying networking and security groups, right? So we can take the same software and run it on VMware, OpenStack, AWS, any kind, number of public clouds out there. But there is flip side to it, right? There is obviously an argument of not using Kubernetes, for not using Kubernetes to run MySQL. So I think in our experience, one of the major things was the learning curve of Kubernetes. Because Kubernetes, once you go from this server-based, virtual machine-based world, physical world with something that like Kubernetes, uh, with its own constructs like containers, pods, uh, its own um, service IPs, uh, config maps, and so on. There are a lot of things to learn. And they don't map one-to-one -one from, a, from a server model to this new cloud-native model. So you really need a team who is sold on Kubernetes and really want to adopt Kubernetes to, to run all sorts of workloads. Uh, and uh, it is definitely not as easy as just consuming a, consuming a MySQL service, because you have to deal with failures. You have to understand why failures happen. Um, so this is, there are a few things that you can automate, but there are definitely corner cases you need to watch out for and keep alerting on it so that uh, you can correct those uh, while you run these uh, databases in production. Another aspect is that when you run something in, in production, especially the stateful services, uh, one needs to be really aware of high availability aspect of Kubernetes. Because if you don't plan your infrastructure properly and failures cascade or failures affect things that are outside your fault domain, then there is always a danger that everything just fall up, falls apart. And I will give you an example of how we, we ran into this issue. Um, Another interesting aspect of Kubernetes is that Kubernetes is an orchestrator which, is, which runs cloud-native workloads really well, but it sort of confines itself with running just the cloud-native compute workloads. And for things like storage, uh, things like secrets, uh, when, when you want to expose this outside to the outside world, you have to use other things which are outside Kubernetes. And depending on what alternatives you choose, some of them might be uh, pretty mature and work very well. But there are many others who don't work well with Kubernetes. They have bugs. And you need to be prepared uh, for dealing with all sorts of these issues when running uh, this on Kubernetes. Um, another interesting aspect of Kubernetes is that it's, it's famously, it's, it's a cattle model, right? It doesn't care. It, it just spins up a bunch of pods. The pods can die over time or they can move around between nodes as the Kubernetes scheduler realigns itself. And this becomes uh, problematic sometimes in, when you run something like state, a stateful application like MySQL and Kubernetes. Because if a MySQL replica dies, there is a cost to bring up the new replica. You have to start from scratch or resume from some point to, to make sure that it's up to date. So this is definitely not for faint of heart. So our solution to, uh, but overall, I, I would like to say that comparing the overall uh, cost benefit of this approach, uh, we as a team decided that Kubernetes was, had far more advantages that we would like to use and we, we look, really look forward to. And so we decided to run uh, MySQL on Kubernetes. So the solution we came up with was uh, basically an application uh, controller uh, it's, it's a service which extends Kubernetes API and adds new type of objects to it. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have a service which, when you, when you run it on Kubernetes, it defines uh, an object of type MySQL and adds it to the Kubernetes API. So using Kubernetes CLI now, just like uh, other objects in Kubernetes, like pods and services, you can now see all the MySQL instances running on Kubernetes. You can understand what configuration they have, what is their state, are they healthy or not. So that's what it does. And uh, what happens is, in addition to introducing this new resource, 
It also keeps on watching for all the resources that it has defined or added to Kubernetes, which means that if a MySQL uh, application goes into bad state, this application controller software can detect that condition and take corrective action. So you can think of it as a database admin who is, which is programmed into an application service. So it knows how to take backups. It knows how to recover when database fails. It knows how to scale out a database in case, uh, in case of MySQL actually how to scale up a database when the performance is uh, not adequate. So it offers uh, highly available uh, self-healing clusters. It offers uh, highly available reads. So you can scale reads using replicas. Um, it follows a single master architecture. So the, the writes cannot be scaled. It, it, they can only be scaled using vertical scaling. Uh, it, it keeps track of how replica uh, data is being replicated in the cluster, ensures that the replicas are not too far behind the master. Because if they are, then you have a problem. Right? Um, it uses Kubernetes resource controls to ensure that, uh, to limit the resources that are given to a MySQL instance. And it also offers uh, automated backups and restore to uh, an object storage like Amazon S3 or Google's uh, object storage. So uh, this is a high level architecture of the solution. So everything runs on Kubernetes. And the components are divided into three different parts. So there is a control plane which manages MySQL clusters running on Kubernetes. The data plane is actually the, the clusters themselves, the MySQL services. And there's a monitoring component which is uh, done using Prometheus. So on the control plane slide side, um, I already talked about the MySQL operator or the application controller, which is basically an automated database admin for MySQL. In addition, the, we use a service uh, called Orchestrator, and it is written by engineers at GitHub. And uh, what the service does is it uh, basically manages the cluster state of a MySQL cluster. So it understands which are the replicas, which is the master, it can handle failures, and so on. In the, on the data plane front, we have um, the MySQL uh, services themselves, which means the instance of MySQL running as a Kubernetes pod, the volumes attached to it where it's writing data, uh, the Kubernetes services which uh, abstract the, the IPs and so on using the, the inbuilt Kubernetes DNS and so on. And I already talked about uh, monitoring, which is done with uh, Prometheus. If we go one level deeper into this architecture, this is how the MySQL cluster running on Kubernetes looks like. So essentially, you have a master node and a bunch of replicas. And each one of these runs as a Kubernetes pod. And this whole thing runs as a Kubernetes stateful set, which is a Kubernetes object for running persistent applications which have state. And which just, it just means that each one of these nodes has a persistent volume attached to it. And each one of them can write data to it. So the database uh, are those yellow things. And uh, in this setup, you basically have uh, four replicas of the same data. Now, in order to access this database, Sorry. So everything, um, actually, can we hold off the questions to the end? Uh, let me, sorry. Uh, so when you want to access the database, um, you, you have two choices. When you want to write to a database, you go to the master. And when you want to read from the database, you go to uh, any, any node in the, in the cluster. And in order to do that, uh, this operator creates a service, uh, two types of services. The master service can be used for writes, and service is just a DNS implementation inside Kubernetes. So think of it like a load balancer sitting in front of all these instances. And uh, for reads, uh, the, your application can go to the, the healthy nodes service. And you can scale out reads on account of by adding more and more replicas so that the, the node service can load balance between them. Now, if we go one step deeper into this, what are these individual things here? So each individual thing, like the master and replica, is basically a Kubernetes pod. And 
Kubernetes pod, you, you may, as you may know, it's, it's a, just a bunch of containers running together. And they can all talk to each other as if they were running on the same machine. So um, think, of, think of it like a bunch of Docker containers running on your single machines so that they can talk to each other using localhost. So there is an init container which uh, initializes the database. It configures passwords. Uh, it configures replication and so on. There is the Percona MySQL container which runs the actual MySQL database. There are a couple of uh, PT containers which uh, manage the, the cluster state. So they, they ensure that all the replicas are healthy and uh, they, they commute these heartbeats to the, the orchestrator piece that I talked about earlier. The Prometheus exporter exports all the performance data, um, and uh, so that data can be monitored using an external Prometheus instance, and alerts can be generated. And there is a sidecar container. The sidecar is a pattern in Kubernetes where you can do things which your application is not designed to do. So in this case, the sidecar container is in charge of doing backups for MySQL. Now, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the orchestrator uh, and how it handles failures. Because one of the key design considerations for us was we didn't want node failures in our data center to alert our database admins or ops so that they, they have to like manually dial or uh, tune in, fix the issue, uh, bring the database back up again. And that's where orchestrator helps. So orchestrator is a service which uh, has direct access to all the database clusters running on Kubernetes. It is a single service per cluster. And what that does is for each MySQL cluster, it uh, ensures that all the nodes in that cluster are healthy. And the topology of MySQL, where uh, there is a master and there are followers, which are replicas, is intact. So due to this, when the master fails, it can detect such conditions, and it can trigger workflows where uh, it can take out the failed master and promote one of the replicas as the master. So effectively, what happens is there is some time gap uh, that, that is configurable. Uh, when the failure happens, the database becomes unavailable for about a minute to three minutes, and then a new master comes up, and uh, everything is back up again. <clears throat> Uh, and this is a key component, because without this, we can't do automated uh, failover in the solution. So what we, ha uh, it, we have been running this for a while. And uh, interestingly, uh, we have been running this on-prem. So we don't use public clouds, and, uh, which means that we have to either run this either on bare metal nodes or something like OpenStack or VMware. And we tried both ways. So uh, I can tell you about problems with bo both approaches, in a sense. Um, so running on-prem, when you use a cloud, uh, basically it, it seems obvious, but you know, it's just something to remember that you're taking on problems of the cloud as well as this layer on top of it, which is Kubernetes. And uh, typically in our, uh, our um, uh, practice, we found that uh, software networking problems in the underlying layer impact Kubernetes quite a bit. So if the software networking has a bug, uh, what happens typically is that the load balancer in Kubernetes doesn't work well. And if you, are, uh, if you consume this Kubernetes service from outside Kubernetes, that causes issues. Storage in Kubernetes, in case of private clouds, is not very well developed in our experience. And different storage providers have different type of limitations that you need to deal with. But there are some companies uh, which now develop uh, storage, which is Kubernetes native. And um, in hindsight, if that was, the, that was something that was available to us, that would have made us uh, much, uh, much more, uh, our implementation much more uh, smoother. Um, running on bare metal comes up with us, its own challenges. Um, and one of the key challenges is that a load balancer. If you run everything inside Kubernetes, uh, then you don't need a load balancer. But when you consume it from outside, you need to expose the services outside the Kubernetes uh, networking namespace. And that's where you need something like an external load balancer 
in order to get to the, the services. And if you run this on bare metal, then the load balancer options are fairly limited. Like if you go to a public clouds, uh, you can use a public clouds load balancer in order to uh, access your uh, Kubernetes services. But on on-prem, um, there is pretty much only two choices, which is the, the bare metal, uh, there's a project called bare metal load balancing, metal LB. And uh, another one option you have is uh, the node port based uh, uh, load balancer. Some of the must-haves, if you, if, you, if you go for this kind of model of running Kubernetes on-prem, or even in public cloud, when you want to run your own Kubernetes. Uh, we learned that multi-master, having a multi-master architecture is must-have, because uh, no failures can happen anytime, and if your one master goes down, then that brings down the availability of the entire cluster. Uh, it is also a very good idea to have backup and restore workflow in place for Kubernetes clusters, just to account for uh, some of the, the key failures with your architecture or maybe a disaster. Uh, backups are paramount of paramount importance. So I'm kind of glad that we, uh, when we are looking for alternatives, we only looked out for solutions which could provide us a complete backup and restore workflow for MySQL because there were a couple of instances uh, over this period where uh, the unexpected, some unexpected failures caused all the, uh, all the nodes in our cluster to become unavailable. And uh, then we could restore it from a backup. And monitoring is very important. You need to monitor uh, Kubernetes as well as monitor the, the, uh, the MySQL layer. Um, so in the software stack itself, uh, we, uh, we found a few issues. So uh, when, you, when you run stateful set on Kubernetes, what happens is if you delete the stateful set, the, the compute portion of it, the pod goes away, but the volumes remain. The, the state of the, the database remains in the cluster. And when you run it on-prem, especially on bare metal, uh, we ran into cases where older volumes got attached to newer databases, which we didn't want. And we fixed this issue by assigning ownership so that everything just cl gets cleaned up. And uh, for data availability, let's say if somebody accidentally deletes a database, we rely on backups. Um, MySQL upgrades are still disruptive with this operator implementation, and we would like to go to a mode where they are seamless. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is, uh, this is a solution which has a single master. So if the master goes down, there's a blip in the availability until the new master becomes available. And uh, we want to go to uh, a model where the database is always available using a multi-master replication. Uh, another problem is that uh, we currently have backups which are based on My MySQL dump tool, and uh, we would like to graduate to a snapshot-based model so that we can take frequent snapshots, and there is not much time difference between uh, the state of the database and the, the backup that we have to restore it from. Uh, on orchestrator side, we also ran into a few bugs uh, that, that we fixed in the, the operator code. So uh, some of the future things for this project are, as I mentioned, we want a, a multi-master implementation. Uh, we, we plan to use proxy SQL, which is the, the load balancer for MySQL in front, so that individual master failures don't impact the, the availability of the database. Uh, the snapshot support that, that I just mentioned. Uh, we would like to extend the backup options of uh, this current offering. Currently, it can do public clouds and object storage as a backup but uh, we want to extend it so that it can use a file system like NFS for backups. And uh, Simlips upgrades is another objective. When we go from one minor version of MySQL to another, currently we take down the database, upgrade it, and bring it back. We would like to make it uh, an online process and handle it in Kubernetes layer itself. So with that, um, I'm almost at the end of my talk. So here are some of the links. Uh, this operator. Uh, I should mention that this was developed by a company called Press Labs. It's an open source operator, and we, we, we help them uh, take this effort further by, by using it on-prem, providing their feedback, fixing bugs, and so on. 
Um, the Orchestrator project is also an open source project that you can check out. Uh, if you like this kind of model of running your applications on Kubernetes, which are sort of self-healing, uh, I would encourage you to uh, look at this uh, project called Cube Builder. Uh, what it is is it's basically a tool to generate scaffold for these Kubernetes controllers. So a lot of the, the underlying machinery that you would need to talk to Kubernetes, bring the service up, build it, uh, the scaffold spits out code so that you can just focus on writing the business logic for your application. So with that, I think I'm at the end of the talk and happy, happy to take on any questions. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, does that mean that um, you're, as each MySQL replica comes up, it's just you know, carving out just a local volume on the, on the VM? It's not doing any, uh, any network storage or anything? Yeah, so um, we, we tried both approaches. So uh, our initial attempt, we uh, used directly a storage provider, which was given by our backend storage array that we have in our data center. Uh, but we ran into a lot of limitations. Uh, for example, this uh, controller didn't give us flexibility to define sizes of the volumes. It would just create a stock volume of fixed size regardless. Um, we had our availability issues which, which caused a lot of failures in our environment because uh, all the storage connections used to go through a single virtual IP. And in some cases when the, the single virtual IP became unavailable, our entire, uh, Kuban uh, entire MySQL cluster became uh, compromised, even though it had all the replicas. Then we, on the OpenStack side, we, we actually tried Cinder. And then what we did was we, uh, we used LVM as the storage provider in Cinder. And the Cinder box provided uh, volumes to all these nodes. So that worked out better, because what we did was we, um, in each AZ, we created a Cinder node with its, with its own storage, and then we created a MySQL cluster where each replica was confined to that AZ. So even though that availability zone had issues, they never failed together, and that worked out pretty well for us. Uh, but yeah, local volumes is something that uh, we were looking at, but given its limitations, like you have to statically carve them out, and you have to plan it so that uh, like, for example, if you have 50 volumes, I can only create 50 databases. And we didn't want that option. If you were uh, doing it again today, would you use something like Portworx? Yeah. Yeah. Portworx is uh, something that's definitely, yeah, OK. <laughs> Yeah, so the monitoring happens um, at two levels. So Kubernetes monitors the objects that it knows about, because this MySQL cluster uh, is an object which, is, which only the controller is aware of, the, the MySQL controller. And what it is doing is it creates a stateful set, Kubernetes stateful set, and the stateful set in turn has pods and services and things like that. So Kubernetes can do health checks to pods to make sure that the, the MySQL process is running and it's responding. Uh, and it can move them around if it becomes uh, unavailable. In addition, you want to have monitoring at the application level. So at the MySQL level, there are things like how many concurrent connections the database has, or how many logs, what, at what rate you're doing log writes, or for a replica, how many log, what is the log uh, index at the replica versus a master, how far behind it is. So those kind of things we, we monitor using the, the Prometheus component I talked about. Yeah, so initially we used node ports because that was the simplest option we had. But as you know, node ports bring up services at some random ports, which are 
very high range, 30,000 plus. So what happens is we have these bunch of services which still run in VMs, and they can't, the only way they can talk to this MySQL is through, through node ports. And in case of disasters, uh, if our database goes down and we bring it up on, in, in some other Kubernetes cluster, or in the same cluster using a different uh, MySQL object, this node port changes. And uh, that is quite visible to our application. If you use a load balancer, this problem won't be there. So each one of them comes up with some bells and whistles. Uh, we used HA proxy based load balancer, but um, when it runs on top of a software network layer like OpenStack, if the software networking layer has some issues, then uh, this load balancer becomes unavailable. So each one of them come up with their own sort of uh, ad advantages and disadvantages. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, staying up late. And yeah, if you have more questions, just you can talk to me.